Hi everyone, my name is Tegan and welcome back to Tandy Writes. Today I want to do kind of a remake of a video I made last year, maybe two years ago by now, where I went through the annotations and the highlights I did for my first book, Beauty and the Breakdown, but I wanted it to go for this book, Paper Forest, My Beloved, which came out... I have no idea when I'm uploading this. It came out in June. <laughs> But I wanted to go through, because the highlights I have and the annotations I have are just picking out like some of my favourite parts, some bits that are special to me. I just wanted to offer maybe a little more insight to the writing process and just reasons why I love bits so much and just my personal interpretation of my words. So I've got this big gap here so I can put my little quotes on the screen. I'll try and caption this video nicely, just because I know I am a struggle to understand sometimes. So let's begin. I've been practicing my signature today in a shiny silver pen because these pages are black which I didn't think about for like I say signing purposes but like the reality of me ever signing another one of these books is like slim to none but I've been practicing my signature I love that I have the dedication for the entire book hidden up here in the copyright page and then a page with just this quote but this quote is very important to me it is and into the forest I go to lose my mind and find my soul by Mary Danu, I believe. I stumbled across this quote probably around the time I started writing this book in 2017. I believe it's a quote from 2014. But when I originally found it, it was credited to some other like male poet from decades ago who is no longer alive. But there was no source for the quote for this man. It was just a they just like his there's a website for the archive of his works and his quotes. And this quote was on there, but it wasn't linked to any source, and no one could find out the source. And then I happened to stumble upon it on Tumblr, and I think I found the original owner. So I've credited the quote to this person, because I'm pretty sure it is them, and this quote has somehow been wrapped up to this guy called John. But anyway, this quote has been part of this book since I started writing this book. This quote I have known about the entire time I've been doing this. So very early on in the writing process and it's become the foundation of this book and it's also the foundation of what I hope will become the trilogy of books. Here we are. Our first quote is from chapter one. It's on page 20 in the paperback, the Amazon paperback. And it is from Ansel, I believe. And she says, I can't see you. Can you come closer? I don't have my glasses. The moment I wrote this line, I knew a variant it was going to appear in the book again and I knew exactly how it was going to appear. Ansel's character doesn't have a huge amount of time to be explored deeply on page due to um, choices that he makes throughout the book where he's just simply not on page or isn't given the opportunity to be explored adequately. But I think the appearance, the first appearance of this line and the appearance later on in the book are the best representations of him that I could do in very minimal words. In chapter two, we have a little exchange. You're afraid of your dreams? Yes. Who isn't? And I like this little exchange because it introduces the significance of specifically August's dreams to the book storyline as a whole and his individual character arc. I started writing this book when I was 16, a year of my life when I was either having recurring nightmares that I can't remember the events of, only that the stress of falling asleep every night and knowing I was going to have a nightmare, and then the immediate lingering terror after waking up. Or I had these one-off extremely vivid nightmares that I can remember every detail of. And a lot of them are very inspiring to this book, which is part of why dreams or nightmares were very important for me. Also from chapter two, the world is painted in an array of orange and brown, but the world seen through her is burnt, the ashes still smoking. This line was originally written purely for vibes and then ended up accidentally foreshadowing events a lot later on in the book which I think adds a whole new side of the character for me to explore. Okay, the first line of chapter three. Sometimes I think I remember what it was like, you know, before. I wanted this line to introduce the theme of memories in the novel, in addition to dreams, and also how the forest can have a tendency to mess with what you think you remember. Oh, chapter three is a fun one. Okay, next quote. I have a lot of masochistic tendencies that tend to make me feel like I'm truly alive rather than just floating through life. I was a depressed, overdramatic teenager while writing this. This line has no reflection on my life events or experiences at the time. I did not have masochistic tendencies. It was only the emotions of being 
17 and feeling like my sadness would never end. There's a couple quotes in here that I piloted because I like, but I don't have any specific annotation for. And because I have so many that I do have an annotation for, we're going to skip over those. But I'll link it below. On my Goodreads, you can see my Kindle annotations and highlights where you can see all of these in full detail, full quotes, everything that I found interesting about my own book. Okay, skipping ahead to chapter six, there's a lot of quotes from one specific scene in here that I love dearly. I'll try and narrow it down because otherwise I'll be quoting half a chapter at you. The first line is, can I trade you a bad memory for a good one? This is one of my favourite lines in the book, and it's become the foundation for specifically the sequel. Maybe the entire trilogy of novels, but trading bad memories for good ones, and vice versa, and trading memories in general. Okay, we've got a long one. Out of context, it might not make a huge amount of sense, but we're going to go for it anyway. Then it's not just a butterfly that can fill my arms. There's a ghost of a hand resting on my waist, another tilting my chin upwards. There's a warm chest pressed against mine. There's a delicate kiss like a butterfly on my lips. It's so real as if I'm seven years old and playing in the garden, as if I'm 14 years old and having someone's hands on my hips and their lips on mine for the first time. By reaching the story's ending, I open my eyes, the butterfly's fading to the orange sky. But we've made the trade, one awful inescapable thing for that golden moment in time, that moment of honeycomb light and a warm summer day tapering to an eternal evening. August doesn't have to bear his memory alone anymore. Instead, I'll hold it for him while he looks at the butterflies. This is a rare moment of tenderness in the book and a reflection of a very brief moment of light in my life while I wrote it. So this scene is something that I kind of just want to hold against my heart and keep safe forever. And I hope this scene truly does feel like a golden moment for the reader. This scene with the seven years old, 14 years old is also a glimpse into my fixation and fascination with the number seven and multiples of seven, which comes up often throughout this book and my other books. One quick line is, I can't believe I'm falling in love as my life is ending. This is the essence of a melodramatic teenage author writing a melodramatic teenage character. It was really important for me to acknowledge the almost absurdity of the character's circumstances at this point in the book. And them thinking that they can be in love with each other after they just met, which is very inspired by more like the secondary school relationships I've witnessed of people being together one day and not the other, and then suddenly they're in love and suddenly they're not, and just the impulsiveness and the absurdity of being a teenager. Okay, chapter 8 is page 117 in this paperback. I wonder how much longer I'll punish myself for I accept that I have to live this feeling, no matter how wrong it feels, it's the only thing I have. August's character is heavily based on a very beloved friend of mine who I mentioned in my last video about this book, which was some rambling from the forest. And they let me write the character so deeply inspired by them with permission and extreme encouragement and enthusiasm. So I really had their blessing to basically put their life into my book. And that line is a summary of a conversation that we had. And it was a moment that became very healing for both of us. We're skipping ahead of it. I've marked the entirety of chapter 12 as a favourite chapter. There's no specific quotes I want to talk about from here. It's one of August chapters and his daydream but I just want to let you know that I like that entire chapter. Okay, one of my favourite scenes in the book is, oh, chapter 11, I've skipped the wrong way. It's Oliver and August stargazing, another brief moment of light throughout the darkness. And it's just them arguing about the name of a fake constellation. No specific quote here, but this scene in particular is very special to me because it's a reference to when I was a child and I used to try and like count the stars at night to fall asleep like trying to stick my head like under my curtain to see out the window and have a little look up and count the stars and I never learned how to find any of the real constellations or what half their names are what they look like so I would just kind of like pick out shapes in the sky and make my own and this scene is a little nod to that it's a it's a me scene <laughs> But the bloody black bruise of August's anger didn't fade the seasons or the scars or the burn from the words that followed him through the daylight. And then he realised it was him who was being haunted. This line in particular stands out to me because the alliteration of bloody black bruise and August's anger. And I'd like to thank my secondary school English teacher, Miss Lane, for giving me my eternal fondness for alliteration. And I'd also like to thank her for her eternal support of my writing. 
she wrote me a little postcard. She wrote everyone in our tutor group postcards when we finished secondary school and I treasure mine forever. So here at chapter 14, we have a couple pages in a row where I've highlighted the page number to show you that this is very important to me. This is where I'm going to introduce some rules for walking in the forest. That is the introduction for obviously the rules for the forest. It's a few of my favourite pages from the book. And this scene and the scene after are what I think are a very defining turning point for Oliver's character. Okay, we're going to be skipping ahead a lot now because we're at a point where there's a lot of things I've highlighted that I really like, but I don't have anything to say about them. I just like them. The map managed to survive the battle and is clutched in her tiny fist. She scratched her own additions into the fabric, noting constellations and caves and castles. I added this bit while I was researching cave paintings for a university essay, and I was drawn to how humans have always left their own little personal impacts on the world by telling their own stories through drawings. It also reminded me of when I was a lot younger, I used to write my name like in here, like inside the front cover of my books, like very teeny tiny. And then when I got older, I started looking for secondhand books, specifically ones that had other people's names written in the cover and their annotations throughout with their thoughts. So I've always been drawn to other people's stories and their little lasting impacts that they have. There's another line on this page, which is one of my favourite little cute, bittersweet moments in the book. But in theory, it, I've marked it as a spoiler on Goodreads. It doesn't say names or anything specific, but it is technically a death spoiler. So we're not going to talk about it now. And one paragraph later, it dawns on me that this is a face I will have forever if we can't find the gate. Maybe 18, mostly dead, the eternal king of the forest. This came from my fear of like not visibly aging, of my face looking this way longer than it's looked any other way and staring into a mirror and seeing my 13 year old self staring back, like somehow being eternally trapped in youth. Yeah, it's also this fear of never growing up and the fear of growing up kind of wrapped into one, which makes no sense but it also makes so much sense. Chapter 24. A few months later, I still thought about them too much and did too little to get them out of my head. So I was still the same mess of a dream where I was when I was a child finding stories in the stars. Another personal attack. This one is a Taylor Swift lyric and a celestial reference wrapped into one line and is something that I would like to become my brand. So I'm pretty sure I did it in Beauty the Breakdown. <laughs> And the lyric reference in this is from the song Cold As You. It didn't find a home on my writing playlist, but I think the lyrics are a very perfect description of August and his best friend's relationship at this point in the book. And literally a paragraph later, something that doesn't matter, and then Counting my last breaths like counting stars, spinning my mother's ring around my finger in a little ritual, choking down tears, choking out a prayer. This line appeared in another later draft, potentially the final draft of the book, and it means a lot to me for reasons that I can't fully place. It's become one of my favourite lines in the book, even without the context of the entire scene. There's just something about it that really stands out to me and I'm very proud of that line. There's one on two pages later where... I'll, t I'll tell you what it says. It says, I think of the colours I first saw my best friend blow out their birthday candles, making a wish that never came true. And reading it, it feels like that wish should be very important. But when I was going back reading this book again to do my little heights and annotations, I genuinely have no idea what that wish was. I have no memory of lighting this line. I have no memory of why I intended with it. So in theory, that wish could be very important. However, don't know what it was. Couldn't tell you. Couldn't even make up what it was. Chapter 25. Oh, this is, we're getting, we're, we're very at the end. It's like, I like doing it in a physical book because you can visually see how far through it is. Okay. I was the first person in this forest. In some ways, I think I made this place. First to live, first to die. I've been here so long that the name of my grave had faded. I think it's time for me to pick a new one. 
that quote says has a lot of meaning especially in this chapter for, for the book as a whole because we're introduced to the one character who somehow created the forest and i never gave myself the opportunity in the plot to explore this character further as there just wasn't a need for them in any more scenes than they were actually in i didn't want to force them into more scenes for the sake of adding this plot but i would like to dedicate a short story and a year of my life to them same chapter Sometimes a name is all you have left to remember who you are. This I know came from an identity crisis because I feel like my name isn't truly my name because someone else picked it out for me. And like, is your name truly yours if you didn't choose it? Chapter 26, this is the final chapter before the epilogue. So this is the finale. A tree tries to run from the flames. A living tree, foul and twisted, covered in moss and decaying vines, tugging its roots from the ground as it attempts to escape. This is my favourite monster in the book. There's more to the description, but that's just the, the key line. Um, there's a lot of other monsters in the book, but potent potentially a spoiler. They are all out of different characters' imaginations, two specific characters. But this one monster here is one that is just truly a part of the forest. And that's why they are so important to me and I'd like them to appear in another book. Also in this chapter we have just the line I have no doubts which out of context means nothing but if you read it especially after reading the chapter directly before means everything and I have no doubts is the defining difference between Oliver and August as characters. And our final quote is from the epilogue. On his left hand, where the forefinger meets the knuckle, there's a ring of skin that is pasty white rather than his hand like the rest of his body. This is an Ed Sheeran reference. The prologue and the epilogue of this book are almost identical, except differences in small details to show the effects of the storyline. Because one's at the start, one's at the end. We've got a whole book of things that have happened in between. And I was trying to think of the perfect subtle way to describe a divorce or a separation and this song hit me. The actual line from the song is I could do without a tan on my left hand where the forefinger meets my knuckle, meets the knuckle. But in the context of the song is about wanting to marry someone and wanting a wedding ring and in this context it is getting rid of the ring. And I can't believe that I'm ending this video and this book on an Ed Sheeran reference. Anyway, those are all the things I wanted to say about this little book, a little insight into the writing process, my thoughts of being an angsty teenager, and the fact that I still do love this book more than anything. Thank you for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!